What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. And in today's video, we are back with some Lions training camp takeaways. Day number six is on the notepad, not the books. Today, it's on the notepad, and we got some takeaways. Today was a very action-packed field Tuesday at Lions training camp. I mean, a lot of things were going on. We had a little bit of a rookie fight, which was, not gonna lie, it was, it was pretty intense, and it was pretty cool at the same time. Can't say I'm even super surprised, because at Dan Campbell's practice back in Miami, the same thing was happening, but we'll get into that. We also had some huge plays from the offense, the defense. We had some one-on-ones. The pads came on, and I got to meet everything King, plus a whole bunch of you guys. So let's get it started. Up, we're going to bite a kneecap off, and we're going to stand up, and then it's going to take two more shots to knock us down. And on the way up, we're going to take your other kneecap, and we're going to get up, and then it's going to take three shots to get us down. And when we do, we're going to take another hunk out of you before... Before long, we're the, going to be the last one standing. And welcome, everybody, to another video. Glad you guys are here. And yes, we are back to discuss the Lions training camp. We got a lot of things to cover in today's video, but this was one, definitely one of the uh, most action-packed filled days. Just so much going on. I did my best to take notes, but a lot of times they actually had things going on at both sides of the field, so it was kind of hard to take notes of both. But I think we got some pretty good notes today. Also, I didn't realize that you could go from one side of the training camp to the other. I didn't... I didn't realize you could do that. I thought once I was like VIP. Didn't realize that till the end, but everything King showed me. So now I know. So I'll be able to go over there when they go to their 11 on 11s and get better notes because I'll be in a better position to see. But let's talk about that real quick. So I met everything King today. That was crazy. I see this dude walking over and I look down. I'm like, dang, I think that's King. And it was. I started to run down there, said, what's up? We talked about it for a while. We got some pictures. If you don't follow me on Twitter, well, you should follow me on Twitter or at least follow everything King. That way you can see what he posted. Uh, but we posted pictures over there. And you know what? Maybe I should have posted on Twitter because because all I'm getting is, dang, how short are you, man? Okay, look, I ain't that short. I didn't think I was that short. I'm a, I'll give you at least average, okay? I'm at least a 5'10". But everything King's a tall dude. You know what the initial idea was? We were actually going to take a picture when I was on a higher bleacher than him. Like, I was like this. So I should have just took that picture and been like, oh, snap. Hey, look. No one would have said nothing. But no, my idea was, hey, let's go down to the bottom and take some pictures. Okay, well, I won't do that again. But no, seriously, Everything King, super cool dude. We talked for a while. Uh, he's been going to all the training camp days as well. So I'll probably see him again when I head over there. Got to meet a whole bunch of you guys. I met Barry Smith from the channel. I was like, oh, what? Barry, for me? that's you? That was pretty cool. I met a lot of you guys today. So that was awesome. Appreciate everybody that said what's up. I get to meet you guys that watch the channel. And it's, it's different because it's different than just noticing a profile pic and, you know, you see the comments, but it's different to see them in person, right? You kind of, you don't get to necessarily put the name to the, to the name of the comments because I don't know still who they are, but it is cool to see the people. It's kind of stuff to dive into, but I just want to give a shout out to Everything King. I'll throw some pictures on the screen. I like this one. See, I didn't take this one. My sister actually took this one. Okay. So a lot of our pictures that we have today is from her. So shout out to her. She got some good pictures, but I like this one. This one was clean. I didn't even know she was taking these pictures. I was like, all right, those are clean. You know, we're just standing there watching. I'm like, all right, I rock with that. So that was pretty cool. Again, if you guys see me at training camp, say what's up. Say, say what's up, and I'll say what's up back. We got a lot to dive into today in Lions training camp, and I'm going to do my best to fly through it. Uh, a lot of these are my notes. I did take a couple of notes specifically with the attendance because I really don't know that when I'm there, and I wanted to go through that still. So I did take that note according to Pride of Detroit. So shout out to them for these attendance notes. But I do want to discuss a lot of things that I saw on the practice field today. First off, Tyrell Williams, he was very limited today. Apparently, really after the beginning of practice, when they started to go to 11-on-11 11 11 drills, things like that, he had his fingers taped up. So he was pretty limited in practice. He was going through one-on-one -on -one drills with defensive backs, but I guess later in practice, he was a little bit limited. Michael Brockers was not in pads today, so we didn't really see him. He was there. He just was not in pads, so he wasn't going through drills or anything like that. Levi Onuzrike had no pads as well after the warmups. So he went through warmups, and that was pretty much all we saw of him because, again, today was pads day. So they were going through drills, 7-on-7, 11-on-11. They were hitting each other. So that was exciting. We got some cool drills that I want to get into what went down today. But uh, we didn't get to see Levi that much. And I wondered why when I was looking back at my notes, why I didn't have any notes on Levi against the offensive line. Well, I guess that's why. We're here with some pretty good news today when it comes to the Lions injury report. And that is Austin Bryant is now off the pup list. What? Yes, Bryant is back. Now, today he didn't go through team drills. He was just going through individual activities. But 
that means that he's really close to return. Like we said, he can take him off pup list at any time. And now that they've done it before the season has started, he ain't going to be placed on reserved, okay? So he's going to be here for the Lions. That's awesome. It's a good time to get back. We're getting the pads on. We'd like to see him out there for that first preseason game. So big news there. No Jalen Reese Maven as he continues to be on the COVID list. Also, no Reggie Gilbert. For the last couple of practices, that's been the case. But he was doing well before that. So hopefully he can get back out there, especially with guys like Bryant returning. I'm telling you, man, you want to be out there as much as you possibly possibly can. Derek Barnes, who has been extremely limited, according to Dan Campbell, he's been dealing with a hammy issue, a hamstring, and they're taking that very slow. Now, for me, I think that makes sense. It always makes sense. You got to make sure you take care of your guys in the training camp, and hamstrings were a mess last season. That's not something that you want to try to have a guy play through. Definitely not through training camp, especially a guy like Derek Barnes, who I don't think there's any question whether or not he's going to make the team, being your, what, fourth round pick this season, and earn his way up the depth chart, trying to get reps this season. That's still something that he can accomplish during the year, but I do think you got to take it slow with those guys. Quinn Dunbar was also out, according to Dan Campbell. This is for personal reasons. For the last couple of practice years, we really haven't seen Quinn Dunbar much on the field, so hopefully everything gets figured out there. I really want to see Dunbar this season. Whether or not he starts the one or two, because right now it's looking at Amani and Jeff Okuda as one and two we do need to have that guy I, I really think we do like if he you know he's been showing some good things but you really want to have that cornerback depth it's just so important in the NFL and I hope Dunbar is not dealing with anything too serious in terms of personal issues hopefully everything is okay there and we're able to see him back on the field soon it would be cool to see him today because they were doing some one-on-ones that would have been awesome and also Alex Brown he left early due to a collision say the attendance kind of filled up a little bit today we got some good news we got some bad news uh and I you know you're gonna get some dings and bumps and bruises once we put the pads on, the hope is just nothing's that serious and guys are able to get back pretty soon. Now, I do want to talk about some of these drills that the Detroit Lions rolled out there. We saw them catching passes through the pads once again. And, you know, some guys were struggling with that, like Victor Bolden. But it's a really tough drill because they have the sideline really, like, right behind the pads. And they had four pads in a row and you had to catch between those. That looked tough. I'm like, dang, that's a really tough drill. They were also working on, you know, toe drags on out routes. And guys look good there. But the drill that I liked is that they would basically stack two receivers on top of each other. And Antoine Randall would be there to snap the football, and they would take off. And they would take off. They had to go about 10 yards, and the person behind them, their job was to basically tap the guy in front of them. And sometimes they weren't able to, sometimes they were. I know Allison got caught pretty early. Some other guys were able to beat the, the receiver behind them. It was really just working on that release, that get off, timing it up, and just being as quick as you can with that first step. Linebackers with Mark DeLone were out there for a little bit working on stripping the football. They were just walking up against other linebackers and stripping it out, working on that. And the Lions, we've heard some of that in the past, but it would be nice to force some more turnovers this year. So the Lions have put a little emphasis towards working on that with the linebackers. Now, the running backs were doing a pass protection drill that I took note of because, of course, Deuce Staley, right? If you can't pass protect, you can't play. So you know Deuce Staley is going to be doing things like this. Spent a lot of time working with Jermar Jefferson here. I think it's an area where we saw some inconsistencies in college. It's an area where he could improve. But they were working on running backs picking up other running backs. Now, you know, running backs aren't going to be the blitzers, but that's what it was. It was like pretending as if it was a linebacker blitzing and they would have to stay in front of him. And Deuce was going through it, man. Deuce looked like like he was in pretty darn good shape. Like he was rocking back and forth. I was like, okay, I see you do Staley. One of these drills led to a fight. And this was a special teams drill. Now, unfortunately, like I said, I was on the other side of the field because I didn't realize you'd go over to the other side. But now I know. So I'll get better notes next time. I promise. I'm still learning too. But I was on one side of the field. And I think we were watching special teams at this time. We we're watching kickers. However, across the field, from what I could tell, it looked like a special teams drill. And one player who was trying to block another player who was taking off at him. It looked like kind of a gunner type of role. Very competitive drill. That's what it was. Lions put the pads on. And we know with Dan Campbell, he's all about being competitive. Like bringing him back to the primates, right? Just going after people. Just going after it. And that's what he wants to do. And the way that Dan Campbell handled this situation kind of tells you that, okay, this is something that he was kind of expecting. It was no issue. No one got thrown out. You know, there was no problems. But at the same time, you sort of felt like this could happen because Dan Campbell runs this practice with some of these very competitive drills. And that's what St. Brown said after the practice. But you basically had a blocker. You had a gunner trying to attack where a returner would be. And they were basically trying to pick him up and block him while the guy was running full speed at him. It's not pretty feisty, I got to say. I mean, some players were hyped up over there, but they were going at it. 
They were absolutely going at it. I know Dean Marlowe pancaked Jamar Jefferson. I didn't see the Oklahoma drill, but we definitely saw people compete. And when it went down, it was iffy and it was St. Brown. Actually, I didn't know it was St. Brown at first, but I could tell that it was iffy. And they were doing the same drill. And look, these are two competitors, all right? Amon Ross St. Brown, when he gets brought into Detroit, he says, I'm here to take someone's job. If he's a big dude, if you watch this college film, he'll go tackle. He may not be the best tackler, but he's aggressive. He shoots down. He's got a lot of size. So you have two competitive young guys, two rookies lined up across each other. And they're going to battle here. And it turned into, I wouldn't say like anything crazy, but there was a little, you know, there was some... I would say slap punches thrown here for a little while and it kind of all got crowded for a second. It didn't escalate to anything where it was like, oh, all players are getting jumping in here. It wasn't crazy like that, but it did go down for a couple of seconds and everybody kind of stood up like, oh gosh, what's going on over there? The biggest thing was how did they respond? Campbell didn't have guys sit out. He didn't say, no, nah, you got to get out of practice, anything like that. Remember when PJ Johnson got in that fight and we cut the guy? Situation, the Detroit Lions, they took him off for a second. They got him separated pretty quickly and then all of a sudden they put him right back in the drill and they flipped the roles they did the same thing then they would come back on 11 on 11 and they'd be defending each other so the lions just kind of let him go back at it after practice today amon ross st brown spoke on what happened here it was it didn't seem like there was any hard feelings they were just a competitor so right? in the moment they're going at it and that happens you know sometimes that happens you compete you go at it we saw like i said when dan campbell was with miami and they got in a scuffle their first practice well we got a little scuffle in our first padded practice but amon ross st brown after practice said this it was aggressive physical it was a fun drill and if he likes to block all right so it was competitive but that's kind of the nature that dan campbell is pulling out of these guys right now it did you don't want to get to something serious where other guys are jumping in or it kind of hangs on but i think because the lines didn't make a big deal out of it it was hard for it to hang on and become something right the lines were splitting parts and oh no you got to get out of here or something that's something that could have been just you know just pushed over further than it had to be you know okay they got into a scuffle it's football they're attacking they're going at it, they're competing it happens let's just get him back out there give him a second let's get back out there that's what it was they didn't make a big deal of this it was just like okay it happens let's keep moving and that's, that's how Dan Campbell handled it. So I think that was actually a big deal the way he handled it. Instead of trying to make a big deal out of something that maybe wasn't that big of a deal. Because, yes, they were going at it, but they also were just competing. They're young players that are trying to earn time. And, you know, they're trying to impress the coaches. That's what Amon Ross St. Brown said. Like, the coaches want to see what you got. They want to see that physical side. So they went out there and they brought it. I just had two really cool drills going on for positional groups. They had the offensive line against the defensive line, which I got a lot of notes of. We'll get to that in a second. That was exciting because they got the pads on today. It was cool to see him go one-on-one. -on -one. Get to see Penny Sewell. Romeo will like that was pretty awesome wish we could have saw levi i was like why don't i have any levi notes oh he wasn't going through these drills also the lions had a drill of wide receivers versus defensive backs and it was simple it was a one-on-one -on -one matchup it was mano y mano baby and i loved it that was so fun to watch it was right in front of us now i would say the advantage has to probably go to the offense here because there is no safety help there's no help it's you versus him you can't play in zone coverage it's man coverage you versus the receiver in front of you now the benefit is that it seemed like they were pretty much cutting the field in half like you can't run a drag route across the field because they put one wide receiver one db on one side and they put another wide receiver and defense back on the other now they would take turns but they were seemingly cutting the field in half like you can't go across the entire field and also you can't run a route for like five seconds like you got to get open we'll give you a route get open on that route and he's gonna throw it some guys stuck out to me i won't go through every rep because i pretty much wrote down like every single rep but I will go through the players that stuck out offensively and defensively and players that maybe didn't st stick out. Let me just start off with Jeff Okuda because Jeff Okuda set the tone to begin and there is a reason to be hyped for Jeff Okuda this season. Like the guy looks completely different. He looks good. He looks like he's in good shape. And you could just see technically, like remember when he said he was a technician and when he watched him last season, you can see it. he stays low. He really seems, I think what he does is he puts his head kind of on the, the stomach of receiver, like in basketball when you're defending someone, he kind of does that to see if they're going to actually break because all the head fakes and stuff, that doesn't really matter. You just watch their stomach, then you really know where they're moving. And he seems to do that. He does the same thing this season as he did last year, but he looks quicker. He looks faster. And gosh, he looks confident, like really confident. Every time he makes a play. Okay, so he popped it off. He got the thing started. Lines up against Tyrell, and he did all of his reps against Tyrell. They're looking at Tyrell as like the number one receiver. Okuda is the number one corner. So they line up against each other, and they just go at it. And the first rep was a deep shot to Tyrell Williams. Deep right sideline. It wasn't much to it. It was pretty much just a vertical route down on the side. Positioning was fantastic. Got right in his hip. I mean, he ran the route basically right with Tyrell Williams. But he doesn't even look like he's also sprinting at the same time. He just gets good spot, and he's kind of like 
just like jogging through it, staying really low until the ball goes up. And actually, one note I will make is that after practice, he and Ify got together and started working on this as well, which I thought was really cool. And when you watch Jeff Okuda working on it, talking to Ify, Jeff Okuda, again, he's taking in these young guys. They're learning a lot from him. But technical side of it, he's a very sound cornerback. He stays low. He gets his head right on basically the stomach of receiver, and he stays with him in good position. And then as soon as the receiver's eyes go up or their hands come out or they get those wide eyes or they turn their head back to the quarterback, he turns right with him. So he's really, really sound in coverage, and we're seeing that even more so far this season. That's awesome. So he starts it off with an incomplete pass right in his hip, and he gives him one of these. He's had to throw up a jump ball and hope that Tyrell size lets him go get it. You would almost would have liked to see that just to see what happened, but... I mean, Jeff Okuda was on him. And in a real game, you don't want to just throw straight up a jump ball. Now, Amani versus Perriman. This is kind of the matchup that Amani had to follow around. I'm not going to lie. Tyrell's probably the better complete receiver. Talking about a guy they play inside, outside. Look at the production. But at the same time, Rashad Perriman might be the toughest guy to cover one-on-one -on -one because he literally has a complete package. You can't play zone. You got no help. He's fast. He's the probably maybe the fast receiver on the team in terms of 40 time he's also quick for six foot two so he's got everything going for him that's why he's a great x receiver for us but and that's also why the pff grades look like they do and man coverage back with tampa bay he had like a 90 plus pff grade in terms of man coverage and in this drill it's only man coverage it's you versus a corner so this is a very rough matchup for amani to go against and Brashad Perriman looked good. Like, this is probably the spot that you would put Perriman in. If you want to see Perriman at his best, this is the drill that you would throw him in. And, yeah, he looked pretty darn good. So he actually beat Imani to start it off with a quick little slant. Just got inside leverage pretty quickly. But he shifts really well for his size. His ability to break in and out of routes, double moves. For a guy at 6'2", he looks smaller than he is when he's doing that. But at the same time, when the ball goes up, he's a tall receiver. And he's fast as well. So he beat Imani on slant. He came back with a little bit of a curl route. And he beat Imani on that as well. He was able to get a lot of separation was just his movement but then when he stopped turned on the brakes and came back to the football he played through some contests for Amani who broke down on the ball pretty quickly but he was still able to come with the catch Perriman is Perriman's just not an easy out for anybody in these one-on-one -on -one drills Tom Kennedy is one of those guys that won't get a lot of love because you hear about other players like Cephas and things like that and Khalif and Victor Bolden but Tom Kennedy He's a lot faster than you would expect. When you watch him in person, Tom Kennedy can kind of fly. So I will give him some credit. He had some really good reps today. Uh, he beat Parker. A couple guys that struggled defensively, specifically, A.J. Parker, Corn Elder, and Michael Ford. Those three guys struggled. Now, keep in mind, right, A.J. Parker, rookie cornerback, Corn Elder, he's a nickel cornerback. And in this drill, you didn't have nickels. It was you versus receiver on the outside. And Michael Ford, also a nickel cornerback this season. Now, Michael Ford has shown us the versatility, but those three guys seem to struggle a little bit. Like, Michael Ford seemingly kept finding himself behind the receiver chasing on a lot of those double moves deep past on field but we want to see that versatility because especially without Dunbar we need a guy that can play that spot as well and slide to both and that's what Mike Ford has been showing us 11 11s he's been better there but in this drill he struggled a little bit Corn Elder just had a rough day all around Corn Elder is not that big he's purely a nickel so putting him on the outside was it was bad. Either it was a flag or he usually gave up a completion. It was pretty rough. And A.J. Parker had a rough go of it as well. Jerry Jacobs, on the other hand, he gave up a completion short, and then he would come back, and uh, he would nearly get an interception. But Jerry plays extremely physical on the outside. Very physical cornerback. Uh, he loves the physicality side of it and he's playing to his strength he's a very big physical corner so he plays like that on the field so he gets you know beat early and then he comes back and puts himself in a situation where he nearly comes up with a pick so i was like okay jerry i see so some up and down there but for rookies you just want to see good you're going to you're going to see bad but you want to see some good as well mixed in and that's what i saw from jerry jacobs alex brown had a pass interference today javon mckinley beat michael ford to the corner like i said ford just looked like he was running behind him he wasn't able to like stay in front i wouldn't say javon mckinley's faster than michael ford in a straight line but it just seemed like those double moves deep routes down the field he just didn't seem extremely great with staying connected there so he just looks like he's a cornerback that's built to play nickel and that's probably why he's still getting first team reps at that role and I expect that to continue to happen now Marlo did have a nice pass breakup on Khalif Raymond and what the Lions would do with safeties in the drills they would give a lot more cushion they give him about 10 yards compared to cornerbacks who would play five yards or closer to a receiver off the line the safeties would give at least 10 yards of cushion. And we saw Dean Marlowe come up with a PDU, PBU. He actually had a really good day today. When you think about it, he had a huge hit. He would have an interception later, which we'll get into. Great day for Dean Marlowe. Shout out to Dean. But when guys were going one-on-one -on -one against Khalif in coverage corners... I don't know how you keep up with him. I, I don't. I mean, yes, he's not the biggest receiver. So if you get in a spot where you can get your hand on the football, that's your chance. But in terms of just sticking with this guy, 
He is so shit. He's the shiftiest receiver that we have. He's low to the ground. I know he's not super tall, but my goodness, he's fast. His acceleration is nuts, man. And he's just, I mean, bam, bam, bam. It's like, what the heck is he doing? He looks like he's on something, man. He's just flying around so quick. Khalif Raymond is like, yeah, yeah, okay. And he's getting his top special team rep still. And to me, he's looking good as a receiver. He's had some big plays. I don't see him not making the team at this point. Khalif Raymond had a good day. Sage Surratt through these drills. Sage Surratt stuck out to me because he's not that fast. He doesn't even look that fast, but he does run routes, routes well. And you'll notice he does use his size to his advantage, just like he did at Wake. He didn't get called for a penalty for it, uh, but he did come out there one time, ran kind of like a little bit of curl route, kind of extended his arm and turned around and just used that size to kind of box out a defender. It's something that he's learned to do a lot back at Wake because he's not that fast to get separation on short routes. But also when he's broken it past, you know, 10 yards, he's shown some route running ability and he has good hands pretty good hands we saw him on seven on sevens he was able to get some inside leverage he had a one-handed snag today corn elder which was pretty cool to see but he has good hands and he runs routes well so those two things are definitely going for him with this size advantage doesn't get tons of separation but he does get maybe a little bit more than you would expect for a guy that's not that quick all right so he did pay he did stand out i think he caught every pass that was thrown his way St. brown had one of the prettiest route runs today and the pass fell incomplete i'm not sure if it was you know they were on a different page there or st brown wasn't in the right spot what the reason was it was an incomplete pass i, I don't know maybe the timing was just off but St. Brown basically put Michael Ford literally in the spin cycle. The pass went incomplete, but he had Michael Ford completely turned around. My, I mean, St. Brown, and it wasn't a deep pass either. It was probably it was probably less than 10-yard route run. So St. Brown is one of those guys that can just shift really well, change direction very quickly in those short yard situations. And that's usually where Mike Ford thrives. Again, this is not from his normal nickel spot because it is kind of like it's on the outside. But at the same time, it was a short yardage route. And St. Brown, dude, oh my gosh, his route running is clean. Neville Kuda came out with a bang, handed nice really coverage against Tyrell Williams. Now they would go back to kind of a vertical look once again to Okuda, very similar. And this time Tyrell would make a catch. This is a really well thrown ball. Jeff Okuda was in great position. Maybe a little bit of a size advantage here for Tyrell. I mean, Okuda was right in his hip. I mean, it was beautiful position. He just wasn't able to make a play on the football and Tyrell was able to come up with it. There was like no separation whatsoever, but Tyrell did get him on a deep route. However, Okuda probably had the coverage snap of the day in terms of this drill. It was pretty, man. I talk about him being a technician. Throwing a lot of moves at Jeff Okuda on his final rep. He faked outside, then broke his way inside, and then he jabbed inside and broke back outside. But Jeff Okuda was in such a good position. No one called it pass interference. Yes, did they bump into each other? Yes, they did. But Jeff Okuda beat the guy to the spot. Like, he was in the spot that Tyrell Williams would ultimately break to. I don't know how he did that, but the positioning was fantastic. And when he broke inside, he kind of sat on the outside of the route. And as soon as Tyrell planted to break back in, Okuda didn't fool for it at all because he was already sitting in that position. And when Okuda tried to break out, he just ran right into Jeff Okuda. The pass was thrown. It was nowhere near the receiver because he completely threw off the route. I don't think that's a pass interference because he was still running around. Jeff Okuda was in the spot. Tyrell just ran directly right into him. So Jeff Okuda's position was awesome today. He gave up one of three completions to Tyrell, but man. He looks good in terms of not giving up much space. Almani did struggle a little with Rashad Perriman. He came back near one of his last reps, had a chance for an interception, and that's what he, like. He kept fighting, but he plays a very physical brand as well. And again, no flag was called. They kind of let him play this one a little bit. Horn Elder did get called for a flag trying to cover Victor Bolden. Victor Bolden still caught the pass. If Parker was called for a penalty, he was covering Tom Kennedy. Elder came back and had another holding call trying to cover Chad Hansen. So there was flags being thrown, but Amani did get one called on him. He was playing physical, but it was kind of a shorter route, and he got in position into making an interception. And he just dropped it. And then, like I said, Jerry Jacobs on his second rep got in position to make an interception. He dropped it as well. But, uh, yeah, both those guys play with kind of a physical mindset. I think we're seeing a lot of our outside guys play like that. You know, they like to play physical down the field. I mean, you don't want flags, but they have—they weren't getting them called. It was kind of the depth guys that were getting some flags called on because it seemed like those guys were just unable to stick with them. These guys instead were just playing a physical brand, but positioning was really good. So the receiver was almost just running into them. But Victor Bolden came out going through some of these, you know, drills to begin practice through the pads, and he was missing some passes. This drill on, you know, through the rest of practice, he played at a high level. He and Khalif, there's a chance that both these guys make the team because they're tough. I mean, Victor Bolden plays bigger than he is. Victor Bolden plays with more size than he is. And Khalif is just so, so shifty. It's it's nasty. But Victor Bolden has been making some really good grabs in contested situations. Still, he had a nice catch, good route run where he was able to beat Cornell. There was a pass interference called. He still came up with it. I mean, they got a chance. If he had some up and downs, they had a really good battle with Cephas. You know, he forced an incomplete pass and Cephas got him on a couple of slants. So they had a pretty good battle going. You get to see the offensive lineman go against the defensive lineman one-on-one. -on -one. And what they did was they basically put a cone 
about 10 yards back from the center. And it was tough because for the fast edge rushers, they couldn't just simply run around the edge and force a quarterback up. They had to get to that cone, which is where the quarterback would be coming out of his drop. They had to beat their offensive lineman, basically. They couldn't just run around the outside and, you know, oh, you got there, you beat him. No, you had to go through him. So it's either you go through him, you go inside, you go outside. You got to beat that lineman. That's basically the case. Some guys were able to bowl lineman into this, into the, basically where the quarterback would have been. Uh, but for guys like Julian Okwara, who plays a lot more with speed, didn't have tons of success in this drill. Look quick, just didn't have tons of success. But I do like it because, you know, in games, if you can get to that where that cone was, that turns into a sack rather than maybe just having a quarterback step up. First off, Taylor Decker. Decker just looked really good out there. I mean, Taylor Decker, he had a couple of reps early. First off against Trey Flowers, then he would come back and go against Julian. Neither one of them beat him. And he showed off pretty much the complete package. Taylor Decker, our left tackle, and he just looked very complete as an offensive lineman. I and mean, his footwork was incredible. Being able to stay in front of guys like Julian, no chance to get that guy around the edge. Then you see the power. His ability to not get bowled back. Like some offensive line will get connected, but then they get bull rushed into the pocket. Trey's a strong dude. Is he Decker size? No, but he's strong. Was no not able whatsoever to get Decker back into the pocket. And at the same time, he also kept great hand placement. Very low. He was able to bend, but he got his hands right on those pads. So Taylor Decker had a really good day. Penny Sewell is a very energetic offensive lineman okay like some of the guys that we brought in this offseason very loud energetic i'm looking at other drills that i can't even see you can see him out there yelling i don't know what he's yelling about but he's yelling about something he first off went against romeo quora now i wish i would have got a better look at this because it was only one rep and i was kind of late to see it this is where if they did it again i think they would because then they had pads on i would pay really good attention to this however from what i noted is that romeo okora did ultimately kind of get back to the cone but it took a while it wasn't like he beat penny sewell to the pocket and this is a very tough matchup romeo's got speed but he's also got some strength as well and it looked like romeo tried to attack through the body of penny sewell it looked like he kind of tried to start outside and then attack through the body and i would say kind of pushed Sewell back to the cone, but he didn't beat Penny Sewell either. Charles Harris was nice. Remember, there were some edges out. There was no uh, Reggie Gilbert, uh, no Austin Bryant. He was only going through individual drills. So some of these guys were missing. Well, Charles Harris, he's a guy that I've been taking note of wrong a couple of times. But Charles Harris today... Ooh, he showed some pop. And that's honestly something I haven't seen a ton with Charles Harris is that pop. I've watched this film in the past, and Charles Harris is one of those guys that kind of struggles once he gets connected with. He's quick. He's athletic. You know, he's a guy that plays off the edge, so he uses that spin move. I mean, he just uses kind of his speed to his advantage, and it seems like that's where Julian is going to have to try to, you know, kind of add some things to his game to attack through guys. And Charles Harris... Seemingly has added some of that to his game. I saw him, a very fast defensive end, I saw him attack right through the body of Matt Nelson. He got low, great bend, and just, you could just see the pop, just popped him right back off his feet. So Charles Harris showed a little bit of a bull rush. You know, he's able to pop him right in the chest, and I, I wasn't expecting that of Harris. You usually think of this guy just trying to get around the edge, but he knew he had to go through him, and Harris showed us some versatility here. I was like, okay, that's now you can tell this guy has been working. I mean, you got Hank Fraley on one side, you got Wash on the other. Right, so this was a really cool battle to see. Terrell Crosby looked good. He mainly lined up at left tackle in this drill from what I noted, but I don't think anyone actually beat him. I mean, he had good reps against Jay Sean Cornell, especially in 11-on-11s, Julian Okwara. And the one that I noticed specifically was against Robert McCray. Robert McCray, where he had a really good stand there, but he also showed his ability to bend and stick with these defensive ends that try to work their way around the edge. So that was pretty cool. I mean, he was, he was getting a lot of depth. He got about 10 yards deep on that play against Robert McCray, who was trying to work his way around the outside, and Crosby was able to stick with him. Crosby definitely looked like the most consistent backup lineman we had. Probably the guy that stuck out maybe the most offensively because I wasn't expecting it. We talked about a guy getting healthy, right? John Penicini? Whoa. <laughs> Penicini played like he was on a mission. Now, he wasn't out there throwing out spin moves and looking super elusive. He just said, hey, I'm strong. My ability is bull rush. I'm strong. I'm powerful. That's what I'm going to do. And he's a high-energy, big-time effort player, all right? I don't remember seeing this guy in practice going these one-on-one -on -one drills in the past because they didn't have training camps. So this is the first time I really got to see him live. I don't know if he always looks like this, maybe because he's healthy. And he didn't try to do anything fancy. He just simply got down and tried to just bowl guys back into the pocket. He looked strong. His effort was net. I mean, he had the best effort of any, I think, lineman out there. He really did. He was fighting. He was battling. He was just throwing everything he had at those linemen. And he was moving them back. He didn't have, like, a beautiful swim or any kind of, like, spin move. He was just bowling guys back into the pocket. And it would take a little while 
but he would eventually work them back. He just went with this power because he knows that's what he does. Nice battle with uh, Drake Jackson where those guy, dudes, two guys kind of went back and forth. Drake Jackson didn't look bad either, but those two guys went back and forth. Drake Jackson a little bit shorter, but he's got some good size for center versus John Penasini. Man, Penasini will go to battle. Like, you better be ready to take some hits when Penasini lines up across because he may not be the most athletic side to side, but he's going to just say, I'm going to simply work you back to the quarterback. It's as simple as that. And that's what he threw at him. So I was I was impressed. Romeo Cora came back and did beat Dan Skipper uh, later in this reel. You kind of expect, like I said, Romeo's tough. I mean, Romeo's a tough dude. And then Aleem McNeil, the rookie, showed some agility here. We know Aleem's got some strength. And we know he has athleticism. But he showed off a pretty nice spin move. Now, I wouldn't say it was the best spin move I've ever seen. I wouldn't say it's like Charles Harris spin move, but he did throw out a spin. And I think the biggest note you got to take away is he was able to stay balanced. He was able to stay on his feet. He didn't fall over. He stayed balanced and he continued to attack ahead with that spin. He set him up too. And guys were kind of cheering for him because he tried to set it up. He set up to the outside. He worked back to his spin. And it was nice to see that from a guy that's basically 330 pounds. Didn't really expect to see that from the nose tackle position, but he showed that athleticism. And it's like, you can see the gift that Aleem has where it's like, yeah, there's ability to move him around a little bit as a pass rusher. And yes, he does have more pass rushers upside. John Benzini has something to say about that because he was bullying guys in the pocket. And he had almost as much success as Aleem McNeil, Aleem McNeil did doing that. But Aleem showed off some of that ability to be more, I don't even know how I would say this, just, just more agile. For a guy at his size, you just don't see that a lot. Strong had a really strong day. You see what I did there? Really in general for 11-11s and this drill. He was able to rush Evan Heim and he did a really good job. He beat Evan Heim to the pocket, but he did a good job really throughout the day. I've seen it from Strong though. I've seen flashes every day I've went there. I mean, I've only been there two days, but every day. First day I went there, I saw a pass break up. Today in 11 on 11, he was playing well. Through this drill, he had a couple good reps. Strong's consistently played well. And he's another guy with good size, but also pretty good get off. Strong has shown us some upside in a lot of different aspects of his game. He's shown to be a pretty complete player. Ray came back and he beat Dan Skipper off to the edge. He can get low, he can bend really well. He can mix in a nice little swim move with that. He's got pretty much the entire arsenal. So while Decker had a good rep against him to start it off, it was only the first rep. He came back and would later beat Dan Skipper. Really, the starters. They were kind of dominant, I would say, against some of the reserves, but the reserve battles were really fun to watch. And uh, then Ali McNeil came back, and he would beat Boehm uh, when he was playing the guard position inside. So Ali McNeil had a had a pretty nice day, but Penasini, Aleem, strong a little bit, and uh, those two guys really stuck out to me. Offensive line, Crosby was good. Charles Harris also needs to get some love. Crosby was good. Decker was fantastic. Uh, and some of the depth offensive line was a little bit shaky. That's a spot that you got to keep watching because I'm not really sure who is going to win those roles there. I would say Drake maybe was the most solid offensive lineman through those drills but there's still a lot to be seen so i'll just have to keep watching to see what i take note of and i'm going to do my best to get better notes of what exactly moves are being thrown out there when they do this drill again because i'm assuming they will finally send us off with some 11 on 11 notes now, i ain't gonna lie this is probably my worst viewing area i had because i was on the wrong side i didn't realize you'd go to the other side and how you would do that so next time i will move back and forth but i was still able to get some notes from what went down first off i got to give some love to jermar jefferson he had two big broken runs but i would say the prettiest one came on a nice little toss like a little sweep they gave him to the right side he cut back up field and he was gone he took off it probably would have been a touchdown in a real game and say he could have been caught from behind he's not the fastest top end guy but he's had a lot of big plays but it's because of his vision he showed off that vision cut back ability able to stay low jamar is a really good runner some of the other things he needs to improve pass protection which he was working on today pass catching consistency but when you talk about running the football seeing lane's vision Jamar made a couple of monster plays today. So I was happy to see that him really take over that number three running back role and just be that guy for the Lions. That way we know going forward, he's going to get involved a little bit this season. But he looked really good through the first 11 on 11 with pads on. Kevin Strong had a good day. In 11 on 11s, he came up with a sack. He came up with a tackle for loss. Kevin Strong just played well. And he shows quick. He just has a very complete player. He can get PBUs. He can get after the quarterback. You know, he can stop them behind. He's not getting top reps with Brockers out, you know, not participating for them. It was Nick Williams. It was Deshaun Hand. It was Aleem McNeil as their top three. Kevin Strong has had a good day. He, he Kevin Strong's been good so far the days that I've seen him in person. So that's nice to see. Trey Flowers got his pass break up. He's talking about it. I always get to see his linebackers getting PBUs. I don't want to get one. He had a PBU today. Okay, Trey, I see you. Showing us some of that versatility. He dropped into the flat. Knocked away a slant. 
That's huge, man. That's huge to see that. If guys can do that, it's big time. And we even saw when they were walking through before they started stretching out this morning is that, you know, we had guys lining up pretty wide. So there's definitely a need for the Lions' ability to drop into coverage. They have guys that can do it, but the biggest transition was Trey and Romeo. Not even as Romeo as much as Trey, in my opinion. But Trey to get a PBU, I think, is a really good sign for big things to come. Pittman had some nice pass breakups. He's been flying around over the middle of the field. This is back-to-back -back days. We're talking about a pick yesterday. Big plays today. Potentially could have had picks today. Everything King brought up that 57, you know, made a play on the football, and that was Anthony Pittman. So Pittman's had a couple of days he's strung together with some solid play. And again, there's Ross about to be won because Jalen Rees-Babin is still not there. Deion Hamilton had his good days. Now Pittman's coming back, fighting back. Obviously, we know Alex and Jamie as the starting too. So when Dan Campbell saying watch inside linebackers because we're going to rotate like four guys, right now, I mean, these two guys are making a strong case. Anthony Pittman's just kind of coming up, and he's like, hey, here I am. Let me make some plays in pass coverage now that I'm a little bit in better shape. One of the coolest notes is that if he was getting some reps at nickel and dime packages in different positions, and Aaron Glenn touched on it today. Big, he's physical, he's fast. We can use this guy everywhere. Heck, we could even use him at safety. I know Rad, he's liking to hear that. But yeah, they use Iffy all over the field today, and that's where I think if he's going to see his reps this season. I was kind of waiting for this to happen because I see Iffy as a guy that can play as an extra deep be on the field you know i don't know how much reps he's gonna get outside corner well but if dunbar is missing some time you need guys that can step up mike ford you know is trying to show some versatility there he looks better at the slot corn elder looks like just a pure slot so if he's a guy that's gonna have a chance you know to get some reps but they've been using him over the all over the field now recently and that's really cool he's like i don't want to overuse him at too many spots i just want to use him at the spots that he excels at or went out there at nickel and he played well he broke up uh, two screens today he just jumped around he flied around he just looks at his best at nickel aj parker Gave up two big touchdowns today. This overall today was just a bad day for A.J. Parker, which kind of stinks. Last time I went there, it was a little bit of up and down, but there were some plays. Today was just rough. Whether it was one-on-ones, then he goes to 11-on-11s, and he just had a bad day. He gave up two plus 40-yard completions. That, that's a problem. Now, again, he's young, so this thing is going to happen. The question is not necessarily how he played today. The question is how is he going to respond tomorrow? What is he going to come out like? Can he get his confidence back? And that's hopefully the coaches are helping him and getting that confidence back into him because A.J. Parker has got a lot of potential and he's had shown some good things. He just needs to get that confidence up because if that confidence is down, like we know, it's it's a game changer. We got to build that up back with him. So hopefully he comes back and he comes out strong tomorrow. But he gave up two big catches today, specifically Quinta Cephas and Amon Ross St. Brown. Now, Amon Ross St. Brown had like a big touchdown grab right up the seam, attacking the seam of the defense. And Quinta Cephas made a play on the outside. Look, the Lions have been trying to mix in some of these deep passes and they've had some success with it specifically with the second and third unit the first unit hasn't had a ton actually today we had another interception third straight day with the pick on my dad i'm excited to see this defense ability to make some plays in the back end and today it came from another corner it was amani so while Perriman was giving him some fits he did come up with a pick on Perriman today now Perriman did beat him on the long ball but jared golf under threw it a tad and Amani was right there to jump on it, high point it, come down with an interception. And it was hype. Guys were just going crazy. They've been doing it every time a play has been made. Guys are going crazy. And it was early. Goff did throw a pick today. Yes, I know the end of the world. He's the worst quarterback ever. No, I'm playing. But seriously, it happens. It's training camp. But it's really nice to see. I really want to see his defensive backs make plays. Again, a little bit under throw there by Jared Goff. But he's been very limited to short intermediate routes. And I would actually give that credit to the secondary. I'm just saying, man, when you talk about the way that this first string secondary specifically has played in terms of cornerback play and also the safeties, they're flying around, they're playing at a high level and they're forcing things underneath. And then you have guys like Pittman flying around getting PBUs, but the safeties are playing at a high level. Now the backups, Second string, third string corners, defense backs have safeties have been a little bit more questionable. The safeties has played pretty well, but the cornerbacks has been a little bit like this. So they've been able to attack on some of those. Victor Bolden had some big plays today. So we've seen big plays by the second and third unit specifically. Golf to me looked a little bit more accurate today when he was going through drills. I will say that. I was like, oh yeah, he looks like he's throwing some dots, but he just hasn't been able to connect on tons of those deep balls and he had to pick. I do think it's important to mention that when Tyro Williams was not there through those 11 on 11, so that's losing a pretty big weapon for Jared Goff. When he talked about a deep threat you're losing a lot of size there and what did the lions do well they went out and they put khalif raymond in when he went out so still a deep threat but you lost a lot of size it's a good note for khalif raymond as well dean marlowe who was with the, this was not with the first unit but dean marlowe slid down into the box really deep it was a play action rollout for david blau and he threw it right to dean marlowe it was like man he threw that ball right at him but i don't think he thought dean could get up like that dean kind of just followed and spied the quarterback across the field and blau threw it up skied in the air and took it down two picks for the defense i think it was a big unless he dropped him i'm pretty sure he picked it off the safeties are playing at a high level because you're showing they're showing versatility marlo's the guy we expect to get a lot of reps so you 
Hope that stuff happens. But Marlowe's ability to play deep safety in the box is huge. Same thing with Will flying around. These safeties are flying all around the field with this first unit, and they look very comfortable. The chemistry is there. The trust, the confidence in one another is there. So they're making plays. The second, third unit, they're still trying to figure it out. There's a lot of continuity here between Okuda, Amani. You know, Tracy Walker, Will Harris. And Will Harris has been getting some high praise from Aaron Glenn as well. But there's a lot of guys that know each other. Mike Ford. They all know each other. They've all played for a long time together. So when that's the case and you trust one another and you're in a defense that built for more opportunistic plays back in like we talked about yesterday, you're going to have things like this. Run game definitely looked good. Swift broke a big run today, which probably would have been a huge gain as well. Jamar looked really good. The blocking, they work on a lot of zone blocking schemes, but I like how they're trying to get guys to the outside as well, spread the field a little bit, use them to strength, but they really just want to use these guys' vision, you know, allow them to cut back, and that's the kind of running plays they're giving them. They're also missing some quarterback design runs to keep that on us defensively, and again, the passing game has been fine. They just haven't found that connection, and it's tough. You know, the offense is one of the things where you have to really build that chemistry between you and the receivers. Aubrey Pleasant is nuts. Even my sister today is pointing out, she was like, yeah, that guy's crazy. She pointed out, Aubrey Pleasant, you know, those one-on-one drills is just hype. He's going at it. And everything Keem told me that Aaron Glenn was over there just cussing, losing it. These guys are very engaging as coaches. Again, Aubrey Pleasant today, we saw him in drills. More teaching, less reps talking to guys, teaching, even after practice, walking around with Okuda and Ify helping him out. You know, Okuda and Ify working on stuff individually together, but he is a very hands-on teaching coach, and guys are always around him. Always around Glenn, or always around Aubrey Pleasant trying to learn from him, and uh, that's just kind of the fact that he's bringing. Guys want to learn from him. Finish it off with special teams. Both kickers went 100% today, and they mixed it a little bit with extra points, and uh, kicking and breaking up some of the 11-on-11 11 11 drills, and they make their kicks there as well. So, nothing super long, but Bullock, Matthew Wright, they both kicked the ball well today. So the competition stays live. Rough day yesterday for Matthew Wright, but he bounced back, and that's pretty nice to see. I think that's, I think that's really it for today's video. I know it was a lot of notes today, but there was this was one of the most action-packed field days. This is the most action-packed field day I've went to. So we'll see how it continues now with the pads. I'm going to do my best to try to take less notes, but take more efficient notes uh, and just focus on certain drills. But I'll get better pictures. I'll get better notes from certain things to give you more you know, super detailed scheme specific things that I can when I move around because I didn't realize you could move around. So I'm gonna do my best with that next time I go, which should be tomorrow. But hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. Again, I'm still trying to figure this out just like the Lions are as well. And uh, I think we're getting better, but there's still things I got to figure out. Shout out to everybody who said what's up at camp. You guys are absolutely awesome. You guys make this thing happen. I hope to see you there. If you are going to go, just show up and be like, hey, what's good? Oh, look for me. I don't know. Say what's good. I don't know what you look like, but you know what I look like. And uh, all you guys that do it, it's awesome. You know, when you guys, it's it's really cool. Someone say like, hey, I know you. It's like, what? That's awesome. Like, it's really cool to meet y'all. You guys don't realize how cool it is for me when you guys do that kind of stuff. So I just, I appreciate it. You guys are awesome for that. And shout out to my man, Everything King. I see you. We're going to do a show at some point to discuss some of this training camp because he's got some good notes as well. Let me know that's kind of lovely. Thank you for watching. And I'm out.